Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, Episode 1. My name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And we've got Matt. How's it going? And our special guest, all the way from Pittsburgh, Wes. Hey, everybody. I don't know how special it is, given that it's the first episode. I, I guess you can start with special guests right away. So, PAX is this weekend. Yeah, um, PAX East. Yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know what PAX is. But for those who don't, it is a electronic entertainment and gaming convention, which has a significant board game component now. Yeah, and it's it's grown significantly. This is the third PAX I've been to, and I remember the first year, three years ago, the board game section was half the size that it was today, and then half of the board game section was Magic the Gathering. Yeah, and now Magic the Gathering has gone into like a minority couple of the couple of tables. Days. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, like it's a, a corner of the room now where yeah. it used to be the main exhibit. Not yeah. to diss on magic, but I, I'm glad it's going that direction. So Jerry talked about this in the Q&A, right? That he said that he felt like board games needed to be strongly included because that that inclusion could bring video gamers over to board games. Right, which, yeah. Which I think it absolutely has. At the very least, the, the, the shared knowledge of the audience at PAX yeah now includes at least, you know, the board games like Catan or Small World or yeah. or Munchkin, even for people who don't really play board games. My goal going into this PAX was that I wanted to play a lot of board games cuz last year when I went I uh I didn't I never went early and and they have a number of different board game tournaments and you have to be there early to sign up for them and I missed out on all of them and barely played anything. Uh so this year we got in line very early in the freezing cold, it was about 10 degrees outside, and got our names first on the list for everything. I haven't heard anything about your experience with the tournaments. Like, did people win? I know you, you won Dominion like two years ago. Like, you were number one. Yeah, three years ago I won Dominion. This year I did the Netrunner tournament along with Orion and dropped from the number two table to out of the top half in the last round it was very disappointing so the netrunner tournament it was it was eight or it was four rounds so you play eight different games and basically each one each game you win gives you three points and i was going into the last round i had a great first game that was really fun even though i lost it was it was just fantastic all around uh but it took 50 minutes out of our 65 minute time limit so the second game i go into it and barely squeaked by on a two to one victory which gave me a timed win which is only two points so i ended up with 14 points instead of 15 that i would have gotten if not for the time and that was apparently enough to knock me out of eighth place but we'll talk more about that later me and orion will do a, a segment later on about netrunner and our experience at the tournament especially orion's ridiculous decks he brought yes i intentionally brought jank decks to have fun and i did good <laughs> I think the only other tournament we did, I did Mega Catan. Oh yeah, talk about that. So it was it was really fun. It would it only took like an hour and twenty minutes, which I was really happy with. It was just like, when are you gonna get the chance to play Catan with twenty or thirty people at a table? That's like a a fantasy of mine to just have an infinite Catan world. This is you just want Catan all the way down, all the way down, <laughs> in in all directions. I want like planet Earth, except in Catan. So just a giant hexagonal polygon. Yeah. So anyway, um, there were 30 people at my table, and we played to 25 points, which is awesome. Basically, you shared an island with one other person. I think I ended up with 16 points, and the winner had 20. You know, one at 25. Basically, they just got lucky with like a iron wheat combo and, and just cityed up and then it just went exponentially they had like a run of nines and tens that just they built a million cities in one so just to picture how this went correct me if i'm wrong it was just a long table and just a giant basically strip of Catan islands yeah Catan islands separated by like two blocks of ocean so it, it was with seafarers okay and you got bonus points for going on to the other side of your island or the next island if you if you boated across. Okay, so you could you could switch over to to the other island. Yeah, I don't think it was worth it, especially with the time. Like the game ended quickly because you know when you have thirty people playing, someone just hits the jackpot. Right, right. With the city strategy, 
so I haven't I haven't actually played the Seafarers expansion, or at least if I did, it was a very long time ago. How does how does that change the game? Yeah, I it's been a long time since I had played it too. It adds ships, which basically work like roads, except wood in a sheep. Uh, the sh- I, I assume the sheep pilots the ship. Um, That's a fair assumption. <laughs> and there's a way to move it, but I I actually I don't know how that worked. I think you can move it along. So if you get a couple of ships, you can just have like a disconnected road that migrates. Basically, it puts water in between islands, and you can you can explore. It's pretty much a, a second kind of road. I don't know what's better, the idea of the sheep piloting the ship, or if it's like a sheep powered ship. That could be. Yeah, because like there's the sheep could be below deck. Yeah, exactly. And there's like paddle wheels. The Garani yeah. just got dozens of sheep on either side. Yeah, like, like hamster wheels, except yeah. bigger, because yeah. hamsters aren't big sheep enough wheels. to power a ship. Yeah, sheep wheels. It's one way to do it. Yeah. Those are good theories. I feel like Catan is more ethically concerning now. What? Be- because of the forced sheep labor? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with, with ships. Well, you'll have to. Sheep. How yeah. did they get it done in, in an hour and a half, though, with 30 um, people? You know, it, it was well organized. I mean, like the the islands were pre printed, so it was just like paper sheets, big cardboard paper sheets of islands all the way down the table. Yeah, but I imagine they had to cut down the trading somewhat. I mean, it's not like it was a oh, giant oh, auction oh, house. Oh yeah, each turn was exactly a minute. Oh, they timed it. They timed it. Oh, so, okay. So it was like night six, and then the night side of the table all went at the same time. Okay, and then you just had to finalize trades by a minute. and Yeah. Okay. More games should probably incorporate that. I think Catan might be better with with that rule. Oh, yeah, I completely agree, because Catan always has the problem where, you know, everyone gets their resources, and then there's just this awkward silence where everyone's like, do you want to trade, maybe? And then no one wants to answer for the group. My my philosophy going into it was, what what can I play at packs that I'm never going to get to play anywhere else? Well, a mega game is one of those things. Yeah, so exactly. So I, I was happy with with the experience. I, I don't need to play it every weekend, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to play Catan every weekend, yeah. no matter how mega it was. It, it, and I could also do with a more cutthroat version of it of the infinite Catan. You know, this was kind of everything was very equitable. Everyone had the same reasonable setup, but. Uh, Okay, yeah. So in a game that I didn't get to play, unfortunately, that both you, Ryan, and Matt got to play was Evolution, which I demoed last year, I believe, but I don't remember much about it. So, And I, and I know both of you guys seem to like it, right? Yeah, I went by and wanted to play it early on, but it was still exploring the, the floor, and then I came back later and all the tables were full, so I got to try mm-hmm. the uh, digital version that they're playing or that they're... Uh, launching soon and that was it was it was good i enjoyed it it walks you through the different mechanics of the game in a tutorial fashion and then you play one round against the ai i found the carnivores to be very strong but i I enjoyed the uh the way it interacted to have you could add different species next to each other and combo traits together and so so in the game you're actually taking like a species and then crossbreeding it with other types of animals you start with a basic species and then you can add traits or increase the population or add species adjacent to it but there's just a base herbivore species and then you can add a carnivore trait to turn it into a carnivore oh, okay i see i see so you're, you're actually adding different aspects of animal life of to evolution your... to yes it. of evolution yeah. i thought the game was really slick i mean basically each turn you're given a certain number of cards which are all animal upgrades carnivore or like mud burrowing and you can use all the cards for any purpose yeah so they all have a food value you you play one of those at the beginning to determine the total food bank or available food for all the players in the game and then you can play a card either as a trait or you can play it to upgrade the population which is basically points or you can play it to increase the size which is what can eat what so there's no like complicated resource system it's just you have like four cards plus the number of species you currently have. And then those cards, you have to to weigh, you know, the value of the trait on them if you want to use it for one of your animals versus if you really need to push for high or low food versus, you know, how many of them you're willing to discard to upgrade your population in, in, in size. So I thought it was slick. It's just all 
in the cards. Okay, so so it seems like it's kind of a cross between what we see in card-driven war games like Twilight Struggle, where the cards have multiple uses, and I know in Race for the Galaxy, the cards are also your resources. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, along those lines. Yeah. Okay, but cool. It, but it's a really simple game, and it took, I think, a half an hour to play. What? Only half an hour? I think a four-player game of it might be a little bit longer, but it longer, was but... pretty streamlined. So the goal of the game is to basically collect the most food and you do that by eating in each round and basically all the food that you're able to eat with your species is your score for that round and that just goes into a bag so the food mechanism isn't something you have to worry about throughout it's it's actually you it's want both. to have it is. access it's both food. it's sustenance it's and it's victory points you, you okay. eat exactly up to your population size and if if you can't then you lose the excess population or, sure. or something like that. But then any abundance in food is just more victory points. No, any abundance in food stays in the communal food pool to be eaten yeah. later. You can only eat up to the population sizes of your species. Oh, so it's actually the yeah. population size at the end of the game that's your points. No, but you're doing this each round. So if you, say say you discard a bunch of your, your cards early on to upgrade population size, that's great. You can eat more food early on. But then other people might be getting ahead of you in, in traits in a way that they can eke out more food or harm your creatures later in the game. So if you have a population four species, you can eat four food with that, and which go into your bag points. and yeah. count as four victory it, points later. I see. You know, and, I see. and if everyone's super nice, and then you could get four every round from that species. But sure. more likely, you're going to have to do something else, like get bigger so that predators can't eat you. Or... or or become a predator yourself. Or what, learn how to climb what, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess that's what both of us did. I made the mistake. I became a, a predator on the very first round, which probably was a bad idea, but worked out for me. And everyone hated me because I was just the entire game choosing who was I going to eat. Well, yeah, you, you had an abundance of prey. Yeah, and it was this round, like every round it was like the guy next to me would be like, ha, you can't eat me. I, I made myself, you know, a larger animal. I was like, ha. So did I. I'm one ahead of you. I'm still eating you. And then um, I found this card, prey or uh, pack, pack hunting. Beautiful. <laughs> you you add you add your population to your body size. Oh wow! For comparisons to to, yeah. to eat, that was devastating. After that, I just ate everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I paired that with a, 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 a scavenger creature. So basically, he got free food anytime a carnivore ate. So I was just like. So you became a pack of velociraptors. Yeah, follow. Well, I mean, I was even I was either that or wolves because like dogs are technically scavengers, you know. How do you guys think that the theme like tied into the game, or could you could you see this game stripped of its theme and still being fun? The theme definitely adds a lot to it. I think it's all about the theme. I mean, I think I think it's a good game. The mechanics are good, but it is light. It's it's quick, and it's just awesome. Like I've got you know, I've got this awesome giant predator and then this like defensive horn burrowing you know tiny critter okay you know it just it's cool you you're making these creatures okay so there is like a substantial creative side to it because when i think of card games like this or you know hybrid games in a way it makes me think of dominion um because when i first started playing dominion it it was so much more lore based and so much more story based for me of like, Oh, I've got these villages and I've got these mines and it was much less about the card mechanics and more about, you know, like making this dominion, my, this little dominion of my own and expanding it in provinces and things like that. And now when I look back and I play dominion, I don't think about it that way anymore at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you think that this is something that could be min max like dominion in that way of you have a strategy and you stick to it or do you like do you love the idea it's of, too like, random you know, for that okay. like the other thing like you only draw five or six yeah you have to play around, the hand of cards so, you get yeah you know maybe you you strike the lottery and have like a great predator combo early on you go with that mm -hmm. maybe you've got defensive or you know okay. some food combo it's not going to get min-maxed because it's, it's more random. Okay. One of the games that I got to try out that I've been meaning to try for a long time is uh, Star Realms, which was made by someone, I believe, who used to work for Magic the Gathering, or used to work on Magic the Gathering, then worked on the deck builder Ascension, uh, which is very popular. 
and then kind of went off on his own because he wanted to distill the formula down even more and made this game called Star Realms, which is a distillation of the deck building genre. Yeah, it's, it's really simple. It fits in a little tiny deck box and it was 15 bucks. So I ended up picking up a copy. It doesn't hold up to the levels of play that you see in Dominion. But it has, you know, it's, it's really quick. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to play. And it has a lot of the same elements without all of the setup time or all the hassle of trying to figure out what kingdom board you're going to have in Dominion. So I ended up having a lot of fun with, with Star Realms. And the people at the booth were exceptionally nice to me. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it should be noted that Star Realms is really a PAX baby. They That was one of the games that was demoed earlier on to Mike and Jerry, I think. Mike was really skeptical about it, but then he became this super convert and they even made like a comic about it and everything. The rhetoric surrounding it is that it's highly addictive and you know easy to play, but still is deep enough to facilitate more hardcore gamers. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about that because when I played it twice, I played it once at the demo booth and, you know, just learning the game and... I think we probably went over 20 minutes. It took quite a while. And how the game works is it's the basic deck building thing. There's a there's a tableau of five cards chosen at random from the deck to purchase. You have money cards, and then uh, you have these attack cards. And the point is everyone, both players start with 50 hit points, and you're just trying to kill the other player. One of the things that I think is going to give it less staying power than, than Dominion is that the options for, for purchasing cards are completely random. Uh, so it's just the top five off of the deck. And we got stuck for a while in in my first game where we just couldn't afford anything. Everything costs six or seven or eight coin. Fortunately, they have a card off to the side. There's a stack of maybe 10 of them that are, that are basically Dominion Silvers. They give you two purchasing power. But we had to go through almost all of them to just be able to buy these higher level ships and get our engines going, uh, yeah. which was unfortunate that the randomness came into play whereas in you know in Dominion you you know from the beginning what's available to you you can plan out. Yeah, you know from the beginning and also the randomness in Dominion it's funny that we keep revolving back around to Dominion. I did I wasn't doing that intentionally, but I guess when you're talking about deck builders it's kind of inevitable. Yeah, yeah, just um, start with the, the original. Right, right. But with Dominion the randomness, the level of randomness is kind of controlled by the players where you lay out your cards at the beginning. And in those choices, because there's like, what, over, you know, like Goose, how many cards do you think you can buy in Dominion now with all the sets? Is it like They're 75? Like 200. 200. Okay, uh, yeah, something I'm like grossly that. underestimated there. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. So you you can basically say how random and how weird you want your game to be um, right, with yeah. Dominion. But to have something that you can pull out and just be random and have that random replayability without all the thinking or the the smartphone apps that Dominion has that that might be something oh yeah and that's why I bought it like yeah you know uh, uh, on initial impressions like okay this is pretty good I wouldn't you know I'd give it maybe a six or seven but it's basically two standard deck of cards like that's that's the size of the game if yeah, it's in a little yeah. tiny deck box you could put it in your pocket and you're gonna have fun every time playing it but interesting I, I played my second game at PAX of Star Realms with Matt and just crushed him by focusing on attack. And it yeah. was just so fast. Yeah, you you just slaughtered me very quickly. And I was going for this nice like combo blue thing. I forget blue blue is just kind of about getting a balance of money and health. Yeah, so I should say there 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 are four factions in the deck for Star Realms. I don't know the names of them. I just refer to them by the color. But there's the blue one, which has a lot of defense and money. The yellow one has a lot of discard effects, so it forces your opponent to discard a lot and has money. The red one is all about trashing cards in your own hand, so or in your own hand or discard pile. So that's obviously very powerful. And then the green faction is all about attack, but they have, I think, only one set of ships that actually provide money. And so I focused on red and yellow, so I was able to trash, you know, all the all the starting cards out of my hand, and I just had a bunch of attack. Yep. yep. And it's seemed... I was, a, a, after after you slaughtered me, I was immediately skeptical that there were other winning strategies. Yeah, but... I'm really skeptical there. So so that's one question about the replayability. You know, can you make a blue deck win? I'm not sure. I mean, 
my strategy was a slower strategy. My right. strategy was was going to draw the game out. If there's not a combo there, you know, that I was missing, then that green just, like, you're going to slaughter me. Well, I mean, as and as we know with Dominion, the ability to trash your early game cards is extremely powerful. And so I think probably at higher levels of play with Star Realms, the players are essentially fighting over those red cards. Yeah. And I think you have to incorporate the red faction into your strategy. I can't see any other way around it. But even on a baseline level, it seemed like... And and this is the thing. I know there are expansions that increase the player count of Star Realms up from two to three or four players. And I think... Actually, I think you can do that if you just have two copies of the game. You can do a three or four player game. And there are rules for that in the rule book. But it seems like on a basic value level, they they valued defense lower than attack. So in other words, maybe there's a blue card that provides you two money and four defense. But there's another card, and this is maybe not representative of the actual cards, but if there's another card in another faction that has two money, it might give them six attack. And in a two-player game, that just means that the attack is better. Full stock. It's strictly better than defense because everything's a zero-sum game. And so that seems like it might be a a consequence of the game starting off as a two-player game, but the designer's wanted it to develop into a three or four player game yeah. because in a three three or four player game then defense I gains see, value i could see that being really interesting because then you have the you know do you finish off the one player or do you leave him around so that you can both take on take on the winning player or something like that and by the time that plays out maybe one of these other strategies has time to get going and my blue combo all of a sudden actually is doing something Right. Yeah, the the blue cards seem like they would be extremely more powerful late in a yeah, in a game where no no one's targeting you. Well, the blue cards had a lot of synergy among themselves, so the more blue cards you played, the more powerful they got. Right, yeah. So you had to get a critical bulk of them before they would be worthwhile yeah. over just the simple red cards or the the green cards. Yeah, exactly. So, it'll be interesting. I'm I'm excited to play it more and if I'm ever going anywhere where I know I'm, know I'm going to be waiting around, I'll just throw it in my pocket. I mean, that's that's the real benefit of the game is that it it's just so small and is a pretty good game. So, is it just the single pack of cards or are there expansions to it? At the booth they had that deck. It looked like they had three or four small expansions they were selling for $5. And then maybe provided another 20, 30 cards. And I think there was one big expansion that was about the same size as the base set and was also $15. They also rethemed the game into Hero Realms, I think it's called. And it's basically the same game it looked like, but it's fantasy themed. But they're doing a lot of expansion content, or they're planning a lot of expansion content, according to the rep, where they're going to do some kind of campaign expansion or they have these different themed uh, class expansions. So you could buy like the warrior deck or the thief deck or the mage deck and then presumably get a set of cards that, you know, synchronize with each other to add to the deck. I, I didn't inquire deeply, but it looks like they're doing a lot more with this Hero Realms. But I just stuck with Star Realms because it was cheaper and the box was smaller. I figure... And space is cool. And, and it was really cool. If I want a fantasy themed game. There, there's plenty out there. Yeah, like, I, I'd like, much rather be in space for an in your pocket deck game. The space was awesome. Yeah, no, that's why I ended up buying it. The Hero Realms box was not pocket sized. That's a key consideration. Yeah, I'm not sure that game could compete as like a, a larger expanded with campaigns and all that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm no, I, I I I'm really skeptical of that. Yeah. I, I don't think it can when Dominion exists. Because if you want a heavy Euro game that's going to take a lot of brain power and it's going to be a longer game, you might as well just play Dominion. So to, to take a break from board games for a second, um, there were two things that I saw at the show that were like video game related that I really wanted to just share and oh, yeah. share my opinions about and thoughts about. Well, for one, Logitech is selling this thing that I think they called it the Simupod or something. It was that's a uh, horrible name. It, yeah, I know. It's yeah, I'm probably just made it up just then. Um, but I that's when I was looking at it. It had pod in its name. I don't remember. Is that like one of those like 
pods in the matrix where you can go and have whatever simulation you want. I'm sure that that was somebody's brainchild of, you know, like that that's what they wanted it to be. But basically the demo that they had, they had this really nice chair with a HOTAS set up, you know, where you're controlling your, you know, simulated airplane or like they had Elite Dangerous loaded up on it. And then there was this projector screen, a concave projector screen that gave you this enormous field of view that, I mean... Do you, so you're actually sitting in a pod. You're sitting in an actual pod that is like collapsible and it's on this framework and it's got this projector screen and your game is like being projected onto it. Oh, wow. And, and so I wonder if that's going to be an option for like the people that VR makes them motion sick or if maybe, that, I don't know if that would make the motion sickness worse. I'm but, not sure. That's weird. Yeah. It was a weird piece of technology and I, I have no idea why no one else has thought of this because projectors have been so well miniaturized recently, like in the past three years and it, it's significantly, I'm sh- I, I hope it's significantly more affordable than like a VR headset because it's just a projector and an enormous concave screen that you just sit in. And it just has a, a basic metal framework that collapses down? Yeah, yeah. It probably, honestly, it probably collapses down to about the size of one of those lawn chairs. You know what I mean? Like a mobile lawn chair that you would put in a little bag. and put Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. So I didn't actually get to try it, but I, I stood there and watched it for a little bit. And if you, if you put it in a dark room, it would probably really be awesome. I mean, the the movie nerd in me is wondering if you could get original CinemaScope movies to play onto that oh. projector from the from the '60s when they had the widescreen curved theaters. Yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't think that it would offer a high enough resolution because it was just as tall as it was wide. Okay. I mean, it was it was literally like a half sphere. Essentially. Oh wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. so how big? Because I'm imagining like a six foot tall, no egg shaped pod that you could, you know, no, like no, an no. Escape I mean, it pod was from from Star Wars or it something. Was, it, so I'm I'm like five ten, and I could I would probably have to crouch to go inside of it. I mean, it was it was designed around a chair, like a standard height easy chair or. You know, um, is the computer chair is the chair included, or do you provide the chair? Oh, I'm, I'm sure the, the chair is not included. <laughs> okay, like, there's, there's they, they, that sort of peripheral. Like, there's no, there's no chair. I'm sure they'd love to sell you a chair, though. That's um, that's really interesting, though. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if that's going to be a solution for VR motion sickness, which is a perfect segue into I tried VR for the first time ever. Yeah, me Sweet. too. But yours is probably way more of an interesting story. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to the Adult Swim booth when the line was actually like really super short which meant I only had to wait an hour and a half to get my 10 minutes of VR experience. Very nice. But yeah, they were doing an HTC Vive. They were doing this little demo of a Rick and Morty game. They had like three booths that were all occluded, and they had the play spaces in them with markers on the ground so you, like, you figure out where to stand initially, and you'd have plenty of space. And I got into VR, and it was amazing. Like, I was... I it it blew all of my my expectations going into it were pretty pretty high and it still blew all of them away. Several times this weekend I have contemplated just buying a Vive headset on Amazon so that it's waiting for me when I get home. Like wow. that's that's the level of commitment that I've reached with this already even just after one 10 minute experience because I got in and I was just standing on a flat level plane extending out in all directions and the guy attending the booth went to hand the controllers to me and the controllers were represented on this plane just as themselves. Like they, they were controllers. They were the, the size and location that they would have been if I had been looking at them with my, with my human eyes. Right. And I literally without any hesitation at all, reached out and grabbed them. Oh wow. And it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. I don't know how, like maybe maybe it it could tell because of the way the bases were set up or something like it could tell how tall I was and what my perspective was but it was just instantaneous like I reached out and it wasn't even like an awkward you know how if you're reaching for something that you know is there but you're not looking at it mm-hmm. how you kind of like falteringly oh okay that's 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 there mm-hmm. it wasn't even that it was just grab go enter in and the VR space itself if you reached like an edge of your play area you would get this luminescent grid 
Oh yeah, they would, my, they would, yeah, my game that. had that too. Yeah, yeah, and honestly, it was that. That was I am in the future. <laughs> you know, I it was like Tron. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, okay, I can't go any farther in that direction. I'll just use the controller to teleport a little bit farther, and then I'll have more space. Right. But yeah, that and so that the just the the initial thirty seconds was amazing. But then once I actually got into the play space that they had, and of course. For whatever reason, doing mundane things in, in in VR is so much more entertaining than doing them in real life. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's that, it's weird that that's one of the first things that they found out with VR technology is that you can make a game like Job Simulator. Yeah, there, there was a neighborhood simulator there that I saw that looked like you walking around a mundane neighborhood. There's like yeah. people mowing their lawns. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that's, you can that, look at flower pots. That's great, but. Basically, the first thing I did in this glorious VR world of Rick and Morty that was filled with lasers and portal guns and alternate dimensions and things like that, the first thing I did was I put laundry in the laundry machine. Riveting. <laughs> yeah, riveting. Super riveting. And I started out by you know, reaching my VR hand down and grabbing laundry out of the laundry basket and going over, walking over to the laundry machine and dropping it down in. And then I stopped for a second. And I realized this is ridiculous. Like, why am I, why am I doing this? And so... Why was, are you doing laundry in a VR space? Yeah, why am I doing laundry in a VR space? So I went, I, I just left the laundry machine, washing machine open, walked back over to the bin of laundry, and I just started chucking laundry <laughs> from, <laughs> from, the, from the dirty laundry hamper in, into the washer. And this is the really crazy part to me, is that I did not miss a single time. Like it, like <laughs> the throwing the, gravity mechanism yeah, of the, the game was throwing, so good. Yeah, like of like, oh, this is a pair of pants. It's gonna be heavier, so I threw it harder. Oh, oh wow, this is a you know pair of tidy whiteies. I'm just gonna have to like toss it somewhat gently, and somehow, I mean, obviously, kudos to the developers for this, but it felt so perfect. And if if every single VR game from a major publisher. And Adult Swim isn't even a major publisher, but every single VR game has like that level of detail and an ability to to accomplish tasks like that. It's going to revolutionize video games for everyone. Yeah, and in, in it's particularly interesting because the one thing that it the VR can't simulate at least so far is weight, and so yeah. it's amazing that it basically was able to do that by secondary means. Yeah, exactly. It was totally secondary means. And it was just the, I guess the word would be serendipity of me walking away from that experience and saying, wow, the best part of today was me throwing dirty underwear into <laughs> a virtual washing machine. Yeah. Um. So that was surreal. And I'll probably be back on at some point to talk more about the Vive once I get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely want to hear what the the kind of things you had my experience was less riveting it was not a game about doing your laundry but about shooting things and it had some ridiculous name it, it was one of those games that has the 80s sci-fi aesthetic oh uh, yeah it was like the hot pink text oh yeah yeah it was like ultimate galaxy vr blaster hell or something yeah that was that was basically the name of it but uh and it was on the oculus i believe and uh i couldn't fit the the stupid <laughs> headset over my glasses oh yeah so i took them off knowing deep down that i was not going to be able to see in vr just as i'm not able to see in real life without my glasses but the the, the little optimistic part of me was like well really the screen's only two inches away so maybe it'll work but it, it was very blurry yeah <laughs> yeah i was happy that the vive was large enough to fit over my glasses my glasses aren't small yeah like they're, yeah they're pretty wide um so that was a big plus to the vive although i'll definitely be wearing contacts in the future when i use it yeah i mean i know i know i could have gotten the, the machine over my glasses it was just very awkward and there were people in line so yeah yeah i just want a minecraft in vr that's all oh, yeah. i want oh don't, it's coming don't they ha oh i thought they already had it I, I don't think they do. Oh, I, mean, I think there's like knockoffs of, you know. Yeah, there are a million of knockoffs. Yeah, of underground resource gathering. Notchoffs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that I what they're calling them actually? Or did you just make that up on the spot? Oh, I just made that up on the spot. That's that's amazing. Well done. There was this moment in the Rick and Morty simulator where your player is a Morty clone. And they basically, the two of them conclude that 
you're you're not functioning you're malfunctioning basically you're you're a poor clone and your life needs to be ended and so i'm just playing around with the environment listening to the two of them banter back and forth and i hear rick draw his ray gun and i instinctively like i think i was holding a gas can or something i just instinctively whipped to get the gas can at his hand like as he had the ray gun out and yeah, pointed yeah. at me and I'll be honest, I was a little disappointed when the gas can bounced off of his hand without doing anything. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. It made me, it made me very sad that I actually was able to do that and react and whip it over and nothing happened. But I'm, I'm sure the developers were taking notes. I hope so. I hope they see my play session and realize that they, they're terrible people and they should feel bad. Yeah, I mean, obviously you need self-defense mechanisms in your virtual reality. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, hand physics is like the first thing that you do when you program a new game. Obviously. Yeah. We we know this, to be mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. My time in the expo hall looking at the video games, my strategy this time was to stay away from the, the center area of the hall where the big publishers are and instead go around the edges because the indie games just interest me more. I, I figure... The bigger games, I'm going to hear about them when they come out, and I don't plan on pre-ordering anything, so I just wanted to see the indie games. And man, it was it was like looking at the same game over and over and over. I would estimate 70% of the games there were some form of two-dimensional pixel art side-scroller. Yeah, we, there's got to be a critical mass that's happening right now. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've, we have to have hit peak 2D pixel art side-scroller. Yeah. It, there, it was all over the place, and it got really repetitive. But it, it was good for the ones that weren't that style because they really stood out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when you saw Inner Space or something like that that had a cool art style that wasn't pixels, you took note. Yeah, exactly. The most memorable experience, I think was walking down one of the aisles and we're walking toward this game that is presumably based on their font choice in their uh in the name was a horror game and <laughs> a guy there just screamed at the top of his lungs in terror yeah <laughs> and uh then just went on playing <laughs> It was yeah. amazing, right in front of me. And I looked over at one of the guys manning the booth, and I'm like, I hope that's the reaction you're trying to get from the game. Because <laughs> it was it was genuine terror. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why... Ah, oh, shoot, what was the name of that game? Two years ago, there was a horror game from a major publisher that they had a huge booth for it. And there's a reason why they had little soundproof demo rooms oh yeah <laughs> like that you had to go in and close the door like because it, it was a mainstream horror game that was designed to be very scary and i'm sure that would be very off-putting to a lot of people to just constantly hear horrified screams coming from the neighboring booth all day yeah but i mean if i was the publisher of a horror game i i feel like that would just draw more more attention to the I, game I, I suppose so too <laughs> yeah yeah i don't even know what the microsoft booth looked like i strayed over in that direction for a little while and I honestly I was going in search of fat loots like sweepstakes and Is that raffle, what the kids raffles. call it these days? I, I I guess. I mean, yeah, the, the, the young the children. The youth. The youth. The youth they call it fat loots. Oh my gosh. That is the most amazing band and album name ever. The young kids. No, 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 no. The youth loots. the youth. The youth. The, the youth is the name of the band. Someone has fat, to have had that. Uh, yeah, fat loots. I'm I'm looking it up right now. Okay, please do. Putting on my list of Side project band names. <laughs> okay. But yeah, the the fat loots to be had were few and very far between. So I just stayed over in the indie section and the smaller booths, and it was a much more rewarding experience. Yeah, for the record, this was my first PAX. I came away with like four business cards. That's the only stuff that I got, which is fine, I, but I did not get any fat loot. Yeah, I almost I almost bought fancy dice. But then I realized that they're just complex polyhedrons. And <laughs> you, don't, like, you had an existential moment about what, dice? I would call yeah. them simple polyhedrons. Yeah, isn't that the technical term? Aren't they also no. regular? The regular, that's a technical term. Okay, okay. fine. But, but I'm, I'm just saying that there was a company that had a fairly sizable merch booth that they were like rare earth miners from west australia i'm not even making this up like they had oh, australia yeah 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 
and you know they had all these different rare minerals and gems that they had dice made out of and i, I saw the obsidian one and i was i, I thought they actually looked really really cool that did you cool. see the price tag though because i think they're stupidly expensive yeah yeah and they were demoing them the people manning the booth itself were demoing them like those obnoxious clerks at jewelry stores who you know of like oh this is this is just 16 karat white gold and you know, they have like, like the like, gloves you, yeah exactly like this is this is only 16 karat white gold what everyone is really going for this season is actually the platinum the platinum setting <laughs> yeah it was sort of like that of you could you could see the 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 sale occurring in their minds and them just becoming invigorated with that idea I mean, it's one of the things that'd be fun to have in theory, but then you're like, oh, it, you know, it's it's just a die. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just a simple polyhedron. I would I would like to interrupt this moment to inform you all that the youth is a Filipino post punk band started in 1989. Oh, I'm into that. Okay, by a gentleman named Dudong Cruz. Dudong Cruz or Dude on Cruz. Dudong. Cruise. Okay, so it's not he's not the original man on a boat. I'm very. You're missing the reference. I. I, I anyway. Anyway, I forget what we were talking about. We were talking about merch. Oh yeah, yeah. Of like, was there was there any merch that you wanted, like that you saw and you oh, were like, there I was want the, this. Oh, uh, what's the company? Wormwood, with their yeah. the dice towers. Yeah. Oh, they look so good. But again, like a small dice tower that maybe could do four dice at once and was what, six, seven inches tall? Maybe a bit more. Maybe, maybe. No, eight to I ten really inches. think I saw that booth. I think there were six inches. Like they $120. Were pretty, pretty short. Yeah. Super for just short. that. And not even the landing tray. The landing tray was another $60, I think. And it's. Y yeah, they were pricey. Makes me want to make my own. Yeah, I could Ryan's totally build make, something make, like that. Yeah, yeah Ryan, you, you got to make it. Yeah, I've been planning on that for what a year and a half now yeah your cardboard one is great it just doesn't have the like pitter patter of you know die falling ryan so uber got a cnc machine for our our location that we work out of and they actually gave us permission to use it as long as we do like a safety class on how to use it first so if you want you can send me cnc files okay and I'll, I'll print them out for you i'll just have to pay for the wood wait well, what is that 3d printing what is that a CNC machine is computer uh, like cutting of uh, a wood in oh, three, yeah, three like dimensions. Oh, like laser cutting? It's, no, it's not lasers. It's, it's like the opposite of 3D printing in that it takes a hunk of wood and then takes away all the parts that you don't want to be there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's got like a three-axis gimbal so it can like reach up and inside mm -hmm. you know, something so it can hollow things out. And yeah, it's, it's a pretty, pretty cool process. That's awesome. Yeah. Speaking of woodworking projects, I walked through the uh, Geek Chick uh, Geek Chic. What Mark said. Yes. And uh, they have some really nice tables there. I told him I want to build one of those, too. Oh, yeah. We got to build one because... Now you have room for it. Oh, I know. Yeah. Now we have the gaming room. Yeah. We need a gaming table. There was one half off for like $8,000. A steal. <laughs> Absolute bargain. But seriously, though, they're amazing looking tables. We're just not rich. Not a sponsor. Support the Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Not a sponsor. I mean, but if you're like, interested, Geek Chic, I mean... Yeah, someday, someday. I'll take away the qualification on my statement. What, you know. what that you're never going to be sponsored? No, no, that they're great tables, but I'm not rich. I'll, I'll take away the... the they're great tables, part. and I love mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, th that would be ideal. <laughs> yeah, no, like... We'll... If you're listening there, yeah. Geek Chic, we yeah. have a game room. Yeah, we have, we have a large enough game room for one of your tables. Your biggest and... table... Yeah, your biggest table. And I want it pimped out. All the drawers. Yeah. You know, if, if you're willing. Yeah, we have a, a game room big enough for your largest table. And I would not put it past Mark to put just the word geek chic in front of every single article at the start of every single video. I will sell my soul for a, a, a $16,000 game. So if you table. know someone at Geek Chic, hit them up. We may not be popular yet, but who knows? I want to talk real quick about a game called Eco or Echo, E K O, that I played. It's I, I would say that's Echo. Echo, yeah, it's probably Echo. It's um, by Dude Games, and I guess they're they're a distributor. 
who's trying to bring French games to the North American market. Uh, but anyway, so so Echo was an abstract game. It kind of looks like a, a, a hex-based checkers when it starts. You just have little cylinder pieces scattered about, filling the, the hex grid with your opponents. I played a two-player game, but you can play up to four. Each player has one king, which is a, a different uh, looking piece. The goal of the game is to get 12 points by building these structures in the middle of the hexes, or eliminate your opponent. Each turn is a move or a move stack or a attack where basically if you have a bigger stack of cylinders, you can take out your opponent's stack. So super simple, but there, there's this mechanism where you can sacrifice to build things. So you lose pieces, but at the end of every turn, you reinforce in one place. So it's not good enough just to take your opponent's pieces off the board. You actually strategically put them back on. So you have to kind of defend against where you think the opponent wants to reinforce? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and to be honest, the, this sort of game isn't really my cup of tea, so I, I don't really know, like, after one game, what you're trying to do. But they told me, like, a two-player game takes an hour, and it's just super simple. So after one game, I, I believe that there's there's some deep strategy in there, sort of a chess thing going on yeah and that's a long time for an abstract game usually you're gonna see abstract games be over in 15 to 30 minutes probably but an hour long one is again that's that's getting up to chess levels of complexity i I, or complexity in play i guess or, or strategic complexity if it takes that long to to finish someone off yeah, so anyway, that's about all I have to say about it. it. It looked promising. I think it's cool that this this company's trying to bring French games over. That seems like a new thing. Yeah, I mean, really, the the, the main French games that I can think of are the stuff on Feld games, but most of the bigger Euro designers are from Germany. It just I'm looking up Echo right here, and the box looks amazing. It doesn't look like it's going to be an abstract game, but no, it has no, some art- really cool art on it. Yeah, the art's good, and I think, you know, it looks like you're playing on Mars, you know, the Mars scape with different kinds of rocks and stuff, which determine what you can build. But yeah. then it's it, then it's a very simple abstract game. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, another game we got to play, which, which wasn't so fun, was Alien Frontiers. We were checking out some games from the, from the library there at PAX, and I'd heard good things about Alien Frontiers. And I, I can kind of see why. Like, it's an attractive-looking game. It has some interesting mechanisms. It's a worker placement game that utilizes dice. So similar to something like Castles of Burgundy or Bora Bora, but it's more strictly worker placement. And we just didn't find it very engrossing, unfortunately. I thought the theme was really fun and that you have all these orbital platforms around Mars and you send your ships to do different tasks of gather resources and eventually land your colonies, which give you other powers. But the mechanics just felt a little lacking, especially the thieving mechanic was way too strong compared to the other resource yeah, after, actions. After talking through it a bit, I, I think the real problem we found with the game was this, uh, I forget, it was like Raider. Raiders, I think. Yeah. yeah, Raiders was the name of it. And basically it, it's a fairly simple Euro game there are two resources. There was fuel and ore that, that allow you to pay for various things to land these these colonies on, on the planet. And to give a comparison, there was one spot where you could put down dice, and for each die, you would get a single ore piece. And the ore is the most valuable resource in the game. It was the most scarce. If you take the thieving action, which granted does require dice in consecutive ascending order, so like a three, a four, and a five, by the mid-game, you were able to manipulate your dice pretty pretty easily. You could not only get, you know, the most valuable resource in the game or at a three, you know, four pieces for three dice, you stole it from other players. So it, it, it seems crazy to me that the most efficient method of getting the most valuable thing in the game was a thieving action that hurt not only benefited you incredibly efficiently, but hurt your opponents. Yeah, we, we had some rounds where... The first person stole all the ore from from the other two players, and then the next person got a, a run one better and just stole it all. And then the third person just stole it all. 
Yeah, it was just going around and around in circles where it, no one was gaining any new resources. We were just taking it from everyone else because that was the best thing to do. My, my best turns is, were when I went first. And so I was the last player in the previous round or somewhere in the middle. And I could thieve and then had the resources at the beginning of the round. That's the only time. And then you got to spend them before but, anyone right. else got that's, to play. Now, that's yeah, pretty that, much the only time you really got to spend your your order yeah, th reliably there, there's the limitation of to take an action you had to already have the resources so after you stole or collected resources you had to hold on to them until your next turn yeah i wonder if the game would be improved if you could resolve your actions not simultaneously but one at a time so how the game goes is you have a certain number of dice and you roll them you start off with three and get up to six and then you assign the dice to the different places on the board to you know gather resources or convert resources or progress toward landing a colony etc but everything resolved simultaneously so you couldn't for instance gain resources that you could then use on one of your other actions that round and i think if you were able to choose the order in which you resolved your dice the game might have actually been significantly improved. It, it would have been quicker, at least. It might, it might have been better. Uh, I'm still not convinced that that would improve the thieving action because you're still just stealing other people's stuff and spending it then. Yeah. I was probably more positive than than you were on it. I thought that the die mechanic was really cool, but for a light euro, I thought it was cool. And then the bonuses of controlling colonies... You had to kind of decide which ones you were going to go for because the, those improved the actions for for the different different uh, orbital things. I liked it, but that certainly didn't make up for the game's faults. Yeah, I liked it at first, and then it just went downhill consistently throughout the game where we talked a lot about the raiding action or the thieving action being bad, but everything else, like, it was it was a little bit clever and a little bit interesting and some of the action cards had some in, you know fairly interesting thing but but nothing was particularly exciting you never thought that you made an astounding play or you thought of something particularly clever it was just kind of okay all along and then in my mind didn't add up to the sum of its parts there's also no hidden information so you can see everything that ever anyone else could do yeah which is a problem with games that have randomized elements like this with the dice and with the stack of action cards that are available to people. If you're going to have a game where everything's open, it's it's really hard to optimize how much randomness you have in the game. Yeah, and I think those sorts of games tend to be less um, confrontational in uh, the combat between players. Yeah. Like like Castles of Burgundy, you can see everything but you can't you can maybe block someone but you can't directly attack them. Yeah, exactly. I'm usually averse to direct confrontational games, games that encourage you to just go after people. But in contrast, going back to Evolution, I I was the carnivore early on and I thought it was fine because the game was quick and, and there were there were ways to improve your species defensively and the game didn't last so long with this game with alien frontiers it was more of a full euro if if not the the heaviest one so this like constant direct conflict of i'm gonna take mark's stuff i'm gonna take orion's stuff I, at a certain point that gets old for for me yeah especially you know, it's just the best action so you just end up taking it over and over and over again it's just the resources are circling around and no one is able to actually use them Right. I mean, you, you have to disincentivize that kind of conflict in a game somehow, especially if it's a construction-based game in any way, you know, or like if, if you're building anything. You have to have some sort of disincentive either with a risk that you're taking or just make it less profitable. So I, I think Orion commented earlier that if you were able to take two resources from other players instead of four, that was probably a more fair valuation of that action. I, I said that because w right now you spend three dice to steal four resources for someone, which is an eight resource swing, whereas on most of the other actions you could gain three for three or more if you're getting fuel, but that's not as rare. Um, and if it was maybe 
two or three, then it's a then it's more comparable to the other actions, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of the solution where if you do something like that, you can't do it again for a set number of turns. Like, that's that's kind of more of how I... Because if, you, if you're attacking somebody, then you're also limiting your ability to attack in the future, where it's sort of that war game risk-benefit, you know... And that you, you spend resources analysis. doing the attack action, and right. you can't. You have to recover from that. Right. But even if this... it's like a separate resource of like you know you you have crew members or something, and yeah. you lose those crew members in the raid. Right. And then you can't do that again until you have sufficient crew members. I, I like the additional cost, but then that adds another layer of complexity that may not necessarily be the best thing for a game like that. Yeah, but it, I mean, certainly in this case, it would have improved the game significantly. Can we talk briefly about Apocalyptica? Oh yeah, this was in the the indie mega booth. So the board game portion of the indie mega booth, which is a section of the expo hall that is specifically reserved for small independent publishers, and they always have a little board game section. And there was this game called Apocalyptica, which is a cool name, at least. And it looked it looked cool. I want to hear your thoughts about this because we actually haven't spoken on this yeah. since we played it. Yeah, so I think it has potential. So it sits in that in-between area between board games and tabletop role-playing. The theme is basically a bomb went off. You know, I think I think Cold War, I think it is a Cold War as if the bombs went off, and basically you have five hours to prepare and get in a bunker. So the first portion of the game, which we actually didn't play. You're going around, all your characters are collecting resources. I think each player has three characters. Well, I think it was, there, there are 12 total characters, so you just divide yeah. based on how many players yeah, you yeah. have. And there are just random things, like, I think there's an invalid, and then there's like... <laughs> Wasn't there a dog? A dog, yeah, and but then there's like the, the engineer, the the medic basically you know those sorts of things yeah the family so but so what happens is you you scrunch around for resources and then you have to shut the doors of the bunker and there are only room for eight people and so the game forces you into this decision early in the game of who do you exclude and you know there's a there's a randomized um, attribute i guess to each each player i was an artist and I think I had I, I won the gene lottery, so I was immune to Yeah, you're very beautiful, I guess. Or, yeah. 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 Because it, beauty is all that matters in the apocalypse. I mean apparently his art increased sanity, so Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know about gazing upon him, they, but the art he made. Yeah. Okay. I mean this is the interesting question. Are you gonna leave the out the, the artist out of the bunker? I mean, I probably am, but in this game I was the artist. <laughs> and somehow I got in the bunker. <laughs> so, so first they came for the artists, and, and you did nothing, but then you were the artist? <laughs> <laughs> that cuts deep. That cuts deep, Wes. And, and this is only the first part of the game is outside the bunker, and then once you're in the bunker, yeah. it, it seemed like at least the actual game began. Yeah, and the actual gameplay on the board is, is very simple. There are only eight, ten rooms. It's very simple. I think you get two actions, which can either be a move or an action. And you get a random event on each turn, which is just draw a card, roll a die, read that number on the card. But uh, uh, one thing that happened to me is I got into this argument with the girl next to me who I didn't know. And the game just encourages you to role play it, you know, even though it's a board game. And, and so I, on my turn, I had described this masterpiece I was beginning, you know, basically to paint what had been, you know, as a means of... <laughs> You know, helping people or increasing sanity in, in the mechanic terms. But in, in the next person, their random event was that they got into a, an argument with someone and it turned out to be me. And so she, basically she was like, yeah, your art sucks. And uh, we role played that out, but then we rolled die to determine how bad the argument was. And it came out that like we weren't allowed in the same room, basically. Yeah, I, we didn't get to see a huge portion of the game, so it was it seemed very bizarre to me. I I came in much more optimistic than I came out, and I don't know if that's just a function of us doing a very brief preview, or if the game was that shallow. It seemed it, it seemed much more on the RPG side of things than the board game side of things. Yeah, it didn't seem super polished to me. That's probably my biggest criticism. 
but I'm excited. You know, there are games out there like Descent, which try to sit, I think, in in that space between tabletops and tabletop role playing and, and board games. But all the other ones in that space bring the mechanics from tabletop role playing. I think in, in this one. It's a board game that you could play straight, but it, it would be really simple and probably boring if you played it straight. Yeah. But it seemed to do a good job of bringing in the role playing. See, I, I disagree on that because I'm I'm perfectly fine with games that have randomized events where maybe you roll a die or you draw a card and then something happens. That's fine. But when the thing that happens is you got into an argument and it's like, okay... You know, the, the argument in, in a good RPG, an argument is built out of your character and the actual emotions you're feeling while playing yeah, the game, yeah. not because a card said you got an argument. Right. And I think what, what this game does is it assigns you a rule and some traits, and you're kind of given that. I mean, it was fun to play an artist. I mean, I have some idea of some art, but I am not an artist. But it, I think we're cool. I think we're finding out here that deep down you may be. <laughs> you're gonna wake up and you're gonna your walls are gonna be all painted. Yeah. So I mean, regardless of whether or not Goose is truly an artist or if his art is just a mere merely a reflection of his soul or his beard, the problem with arguments growing out of characters in RPGs because I, okay, admittedly I have a lot more experience with pen and paper RPGs than I do with strictly board games. The thing is that you have to have people who are. I guess you could say seasoned role-playing game players to have a genuine but also non-injurious argument to be able to like have an argument in character yeah. and no one gets offended in the real world. Yeah, I think we're overplaying this argument thing. That happened to be the event that, that w- was drawn. Right, right. But, but see, but I, as, as an RPG player, I think that that's great because yeah. you could do it. That's something that you could do with anyone. Of like if it's if it's somebody that I just met that night and neither of us are very good role players, if we have a car that's like you have an argument, instantly it's like okay, what do we have an argument about? And then they, it, it goes to that, and she decided to pick the year. Art sucks, and I, I I just feel like that's a great sort of gateway for people who aren't familiar with role playing. Yeah, to think like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's their goal. Whether or not it actually works out. So, like, but. ideally, you do want the organic situation sure. where, where it grows out of the character, but I don't know. I don't think it's bad that they had a card that said you got in an argument. It, yeah, maybe maybe I am overplaying it. I mean, in, in we rolled a die to see who the argument was with, and then we rolled another one to see how bad it was. So, and then you each rolled a die to see who won. Oh yeah, that's right. Which which killed the the debater in me. That it's, part wasn't role played. It's all up to chance anyway, Mark. <laughs> oh no. I yeah. argued so good. I I argued six good. Yeah, you had six argument, and she was she had two. two. She had like two. Yeah, maybe three. Well, just, just think think of it as word count or or words per minute. Of like he he was talking at six hundred words per minute <laughs> for ten minutes. <laughs> That's and, not how and, arguments and, actually work. No, I was just I was referencing debate. I know, but, I know. Yeah. So moving off of the negativity for a bit, I finally got to play the Robinson Crusoe board game, which has been in the top. 30 or so on board game geek for a long time and I, I think it's one of the two or three in that top 30 that i haven't played or i hadn't played yet and i finally got to play it and the rule book is as horrible as i had always heard it was the single worst rule book i've ever read in my life yeah it took us at least 45 minutes to learn the rules and we've played a lot of complicated games before note that this is the first edition of the game what i've heard is the second edition which came out very recently has a new and improved rulebook that's supposed to actually be competent. So don't don't let this get you down on Robinson Crusoe because if you go to a store right now, it's gonna, it's most likely going to have the second edition. But the game, once you get into the game, it's oh, excellent. Yeah. Once you get into the game, it, it suddenly makes sense. It's one of those experiences where you're reading the rulebook and, and the graph of how much sense it makes is it's a, it's it's like a, a hockey, hockey stick. stick. Yeah, It's like you're reading and reading and reading and you have no idea what's going on and then they repeat everything but give you different rules for all the things they just repeated about. And then they do that a third time. And then about 20 minutes later, all of a sudden it makes sense. It's funny. I think it made sense to all of us about the same time. Yeah. We were just ready to play. We all this collective. Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah. And so 
it's a great game. I'm yeah. really glad we played it. I mean, I, I love co-op games, but this one had the theme. The mechanics were good. Yeah, it was just it was all around really good. It had all the co-op elements uh, that you see in games where you have to feed yourself and there's randomized events. There's weather you have to take care of. You can build up your hut. As the name implies, you basically you're stranded on a desert island. There are a number of different scenarios that ship with the game. We played with the first one, which I suspect, and I think it said in the rules that it was meant to be a tutorial because it seemed pretty easy, but still loads of fun. It was the basic, we're stand, stranded on a desert island. The rules of the scenarios that we had to gather enough wood to build a giant fire to signal in a passing ship. And there's a round limit. Yeah, and there's a round limit. You have to gather enough wood. But it has everything you can think of for a desert island scenario. It, you start in a space. You have to explore the island. There are various resources, mostly food and wood. There's food, wood, and furs from animals or pelts. And you can do a variety of things. You can, you can build your shelter. You can improve your shelter. You can build palisades to protect yourselves against wild animals. You can go out and hunt wild animals. You can build new tools or new technologies, I guess, like the ability to create fire. And I think the best part of the game is that, you know, it's a worker placement game. And for most of the main actions, if you send two workers, you just do that action. You do it safely. You do it safely. If you only send one worker, obviously you're then able to potentially get more things done, but you have to roll these three dice. And the dice determine first whether or not you're successful. Secondly, whether or not you take a wound while attempting it. And then third, whether or not you have to draw one of these mystery cards, I think they're called, or yeah, I can't remember the name. Marks, they have a question mark. I think it was a mystery card, which describes some event that happens while you're doing that task. And we played it pretty safe. I kind of wish we had gone for more cards just so we I could were, see what happened. We started, early game, we drew a lot of cards. And then as we went on, we tried to limit that as much as possible. Later in the game, we had gained some extra action cards some of the technologies granted us sorry action discs yeah yeah but uh, yeah early on like we had to get stuff done we had to feed ourselves we were taking tons of wounds early on and so we drew a bunch of cards some of them are good but they have this interesting thing where if you take the good thing then you have to shuffle them into the the main event deck i main, guess main event deck that you draw one each round and Basically, they just make, when they come up, they just make the events worse. It's like the, the bad event happens, but plus you, I don't know, lose wood or something random. Yeah, so, so every round you draw a new event card from this deck, and you start off with event cards equal to the number of rounds in that scenario. And then as you take these actions, you shuffle more cards in. And... It's really cool because everything's a consequence of what you do. So, for example, uh, Orion, I think one of the cards you drew when you went exploring was that you found this cave with some berries in them and we got a food. But then when that card reappeared later on in the game, uh, it happened to be that there was a bear in the cave and it attacked us. So it's all things like that that are thematically coherent that come back to bite you, particularly if you take riskier actions in, or push a, them to get more benefit. In early game, we were just like, yeah, we got to do this. We need this benefit now. Like we, we just we just washed up on an island. We have nothing. That was the feeling. And it, oh, yeah. And that was great because it gives you that feeling of like we haven't even built a shelter yet and we don't have any food. We have to eat the berries. Yeah. In another situation, I found berries specifically outside, irrelevant from a cave, and it put a token on my stomach. <laughs> and I got sick later. Uh, so that part, I, I think, was just brilliant. I, th I think it's one of the best mechanisms I've seen in a cooperative game where you do things that specifically come back to bite you later on. It, it's just great. It led to a really great situation on the penultimate turn where... We had all the resources we need, and we were just waiting for the ship to come so we could light off the fire and win. And then we started drawing all of these cards that we had shuffled back into the deck from earlier on. Oh, yeah, I had and the doom turn. Mark wandered outside the camp and got it mobbed by about four wild animals and was one, one uh, health away from dying and losing the whole game for us. Oh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was hectic because 
we put a fair number of cards into the deck and we were just talking about how the game didn't seem that hard and we haven't seen these cards come back to bite us and maybe we didn't put in as many as we had thought and we had just finished a turn where we used this healing ability that we had researched to heal everyone up to full health and we were just sitting pretty we just had to survive one more round and yet yeah, every single animal on the island attacked me they and destroyed our wall destroyed all our weapons they killed destroyed mark everything our morale went down everything bad happened it was, it was very bad but i survived with one health remaining and we were we were victorious so next time i think we need to shuffle the deck better <laughs> when we add new cards to it it, it just so happened that we kept shuffling those to the bottom right before we would have drawn them so yeah yeah it, it's just the way it goes but it it made for a very exciting game just when we thought we were doing fine and everything I, I like to imagine there was just a horde of animals charging the camp and i happened to be sitting outside the walls you know looking at the sky or something since we had accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish and there's every animal a bear a lion a in an iguana i think and some kind of bird just attacked me at once it was very dramatic but very fun i i it's probably going to be the next game i buy there were there were so many good mechanics but every single one of them was beautifully thematic one thing that was made really clear to me i guess i probably already knew this but that sense of dread you get that nothing that you do is really going to solve the problem at hand so that's a problem that like i think agricola Sure, where it's not, upon you. you never feel like you're building anything, you're just trying to barely scrape by. Yeah, yeah, it, I don't like that feeling in Agricola. Oh, I love it, yeah, I love it so much. Uh, yeah, I know I know you do. In the middle rounds, when we were just scraping by, that's the same feeling I got, but I loved it, because it was a co-op game. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent of co-op games, but yeah, I think that, that sense of dread... So instead of struggling to feed your family, you're working together to try to survive this horrible situation. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make me feel bad that you're feeding your family, but I'm not feeding mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just after one play, I think I can safely say that this is my favorite non-real-time, completely cooperative game. I think that's enough qualifiers to exclude Mage Knight and Space Alert. If we don't consider those two, this is my favorite cooperative game I've ever played. I think it beats Forbidden Desert. It certainly beats Pandemic. Did you exclude Legacy games? I, I like it better than Pandemic Legacy. Pandemic, I would not go that far. Pandemic Le Legacy was a fun time, but it was still Pandemic, and I'm not hot on Pandemic. This game was just great. Wes I, has a chest cat. Yeah, Wes has, has managed to siphon the cat through the hand warmer portion of his hoodie. The cat is taking it like a champ. The cat looks so cool with this. She she looks kind of cozy now. Are you cozy there, Amina? Does Amina want to contribute to the podcast? She's, Probably not. She's licking her lips. What does that mean in cat? I think it means she's either nervous or hungry. It struck me as a good idea at the time. Also, I step away for literally seven minutes, and you guys have to talk about Agricola. Yeah, sorry, Wes. I, I needed another I feel, ally. I feel, I feel and you so were here. wounded. Deeply I'm, wounded. I'm sorry, Just like I Mark was that. in the final round of Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. Yeah, Wes, you, you would love Robinson Crusoe. It's, yeah. it's just fantastic. I looked through the other scenarios, and they all looked really uh, interesting, and they added some unique mechanics of, you know, maybe there's a volcano on the island, or you have to rescue someone, or there's a giant storm or something, and yeah, they all looked really good. Yeah, and I think... I think there's at least one expansion that I assume adds new scenarios because I mean, the, the core mechanics of the game are fantastic. And if they just made more scenarios and released those in small expansions, I think that would leave me satisfied for a very long time. This has been a special edition of the Thoughtful Gamer podcast brought to you in part by the experience of PAX. Not PAX itself, but the experience of it. Yes, we, we do not have any legal or any other kind of connection to PAX other than the fact that we went there and had a great time. You should go. Definitely, yeah. I, I definitely recommend PAX. I think next year, because I'm an old man now, in the ripe old age of 27, or am I 28? I can't remember. 
I'm 27, my wife tells me. The next year, I'll probably just get a Friday and Saturday ticket because I was beat. I crashed hard. I might not even get a Saturday ticket. I might just go on Friday because I was in the main theater for like four hours on Friday and I loved every single second of it. And then Saturday and Sunday, there were only like two things each day that I wanted to see. Yeah, at a certain point, you just you get overpaxed. That being said... My frail if, body... If yeah. your body is not frail with age and contorted with cynicism, you should maybe get all three days. Check it out. I, yeah. I completely recommend PAX. As the only one who went all three days, it was taxing. I don't think I would do all three days again. I'm glad I did. That was my first PAX experience, but I think two days is probably the sweet spot. Although, in November, they, they've announced that there's going to be a PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia, and I will absolutely go to every single day of that. It's going to be PAX, but just board tabletop you know n- not video games and i'm incredibly excited and i hope i get tickets yeah it's probably going to be the most exciting thing to happen in philadelphia that doesn't involve guns or rocky yeah this this coming year i hope i can i can get tickets i know pax east sells out really fast but i'm on the email list for pax unplugged and i can't wait uh so i think that's that about covers it for what we experienced at pax it was a great couple of days Uh, We had a lot of fun, and I'll definitely be going back. So thanks for listening to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. Again, my name is Mark. We have Orion, Matt, and special guest Wes, who I think will probably, even though he lives uh, far away, will be here frequently to give us his his great commentary. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe I'll try to Skype in. I I have recording equipment of my own so we can avoid having nasty-sounding Skype interface stuff. Yeah, we'll see. I, Ho- hopefully I will be back more frequently. Well, you're, you're always welcome here. And uh, so, th- again, thanks for listening. This is the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. Remember, uh, as the great uh, Dr. Reiner Knizia said, the prolific board game designer, the goal is to win, but is the goal that is important, not the winning. Except when you win, and then winning is the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, everyone knows that. Good night.